and um, Dr. Dolan will be with us um, uh, zooming in to join us. Um, so we'll, we're, we'll, um, the three of us will be sharing our diverse perspectives on this project that is led by Dr. Dolan. Um, and then finally, I'll be presenting a conclusion that was uh, written by Dr. Dolan. And um, the first part will be a video that Dr. Dolan recorded. So we're just um, waiting on that. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Jessica Dolan, and I'm so happy to be here on Zoom with all of you. And I'll be presenting today with my research teammates, Yu Sao Ni and Marina Johnson Zafiris. The title of our presentation is Ganguasala Nagare, Where the Medicines Live Creating an Indigenous Biocultural Atlas and Ethnobotanical Field Guide Grounded in Decolonial Methodologies. The Wisdom from Knowledge project arose from years of community-based work and conversations on cultural resurgence and the critical need for pedagogy that supports transmission of indigenous environmental knowledges. It's inspired by the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving Address that teaches about human responsibilities within the natural world. In order to be caretakers of Mother Earth, human beings must be able to recognize, name, and speak with all of the life forms without which we would not exist. Acknowledging our relationality is a practice of gratitude that identifies interconnection and balance within creation, including with all the plants and trees. Between 2017 and 2020, Tim Johnson and Larry McDermott of the Indigenous Organization Plenty Canada and Faisal Mula and Robin Roth of University of Guelph and I built a team to create a digital atlas and field guide that will reanimate the Indigenous landscapes of Southern Ontario. Our project goals are as follows, to research historical and contemporary culturally significant plants and trees that are used for food, medicine, craft, and utility among Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples in Southern Ontario, to create a digital atlas of these ethnobotanical vegetative communities that will be an accessible learning tool to uplift the invaluable nature of people-plant relationships there, to write a user-friendly field guide as a land-based and language learning tool for restoring and regenerating the TEK of Indigenous harvesting rights and responsibilities, and to contribute to Indigenous environmental management and in situ conservation efforts by creating tools that can be used by Indigenous environment departments and policymakers as bridges for learning and implementing cross cultural environmental planning. This supports nation to nation relationships between First Nations and settler governments. Our project is supported by the Greenbelt Foundation which stewards the areas around the western end of Lake Ontario, up the Niagara Escarpment, and into the Oak Ridges Moraine. As such, our geographic area of study is delimited according to the Greenbelt area. Our academic home is the University of Guelph Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership Team. The CRP team is dedicated to mobilizing Indigenous conservation across Canada through creating ethical spaces wherein researchers and knowledge holders work together to implement two-eyed seeing to create Indigenous protected and conserved areas. Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe homelands overlap in the Eastern Great Lakes region. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy includes Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and Tuscarora nations. Algonquian nations are most numerous across the North. The Anishinaabe peoples whose homelands and cultures fall within our study area are the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Mississauga nations, with related contributions from Algonquin knowledge holders. We uplift these knowledges side by side in our project to celebrate the similarities, differences, and richness of living heritage on the landscapes of Southern Ontario. The cultural and ethnobotanical research on this project are designed by incorporating methods from ethnobiology and applied Indigenous environmental studies. I am implementing what Ganondagan director Michael Galvin has recently called the Indigenous Archival Turn, which is sourcing archival ethnological records from colonial institutions such as museums and herbaria, and reinterpreting them within contemporary cultural contexts 
to restore language and knowledge transmission. Ethnobiologists such as Kelly Kinsher, Edomira Linares, and Robert Pai also use these methodologies. I created a baseline historical data set from the archives of Frederick Wilkerson Law from his collections at the National Museum of Canada. The Canadian Geologic Survey hired Mr. Watt to research lifeways of Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe communities between 1911 and 1924. His archives at the museum are extensive, and Indigenous colleagues advised me on the kinds of cultural information that would be appropriate to both research and include in publications. Information in Mr. Watt's files come from the ancestors of current generations of people from Six Nations of the Grand River, Wigwemakong, and other Native communities. The family surnames are the same. As part of our team value of cultural rematriation, I sent approximately 1,000 pages of digital files to several dozen colleagues who come from Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe communities. This is their family knowledge that was disrupted and denied through Canadian and American acculturation and termination policies. I paired the historical data with contemporary data sets to demonstrate a diachronic nature of knowledge transmission and persistence. Contemporary data sources are my field notes from work over the years for Akwazasne, Onondaga, and Six Nations of the Grand River, as well as many community-based publications, projects, language charts, and dissertations. With these data, I created metadata charts on Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe ethnobotany, pictured here, and a combined species and cultures metadata chart. The charts are organized on the y-axis by English or common name, and on the x-axis by Latin and indigenous nomenclature, translation, conservation status, habitat, ground truth status, and source of knowledge. Mohawk language and culture teachers, Deha Hyundai Miller and Alyssa General, who are from Six Nations of the Grand River, and Odawa culture bearer, Brian Peltier from Wikwemakong, are what we are calling our indigenous advisory team. They guide the linguistics of plant nomenclature in their languages and the ethics of which cultural information to include. As well, Tim Johnson, Larry McDermott, Marina johnson Safiris, who is presenting as part of this presentation, and David Beyer, who is the graphic designer designing the field guide and digital atlas, are all Indigenous. And together we are choosing how we will orient the presentation of these publications, what kinds of information will be most appropriate to include, and which species are most important or not. The orthography of Ganyangeha, which is Mohawk language, and Anishinaabemowin plant nomenclature, and what are their translations in English. Our team is cross-cultural and intergenerational, guided by practical insights and needs of Mohawk and Anishinaabe environment departments, language and culture teachers. We choose to work this way because our foremost commitment is to create pedagogical materials to support Indigenous language, environmental caretaking, and land-based learning programs. We are enacting our values through intergenerational knowledge rematriation, regeneration, and reclamation, accountability to Indigenous communities whose homelands and cultures we are studying by taking direction from Indigenous team members, horizontal leadership, generational and gender balance, and inclusivity of multiple experiential perspectives, and language revitalization of Konyangeha and Anishinaabemowin plant names in science through the processes and contents of our publications. And now I will turn the microphone over to you, Zami. So our survey of the ethnobotanical plants reflect phytosociological and biocultural understandings of plant ecology. Phytosociology is a Western scientific field of study uh, focused on classifying and explaining plant species distributions over space and time. Because vegetation is so important to ecosystem structure and function, plant communities form the basic unit of many land classification systems employed in planning or resource management. Extant plant communities reflect diverse processes such as disturbance history, environmental conditions, dispersal, and inter- and intraspecies interactions. Uh, but human activity is a vital component of these above-mentioned processes and reflect human uh, relations with plants. Indigenous Knowledge Systems, or IKS, embed understandings of plant community ecology as well as Indigenous land management. 
uh, indigenous land management was formative for vegetation composition all across North America. However, European colonization destabilized indigenous people's abilities to steward their homelands due to imposed colonial land management regimes such as logging, agricultural conversion, and urbanization. And although this produced environmental changes that shifted vegetation composition, legacies of indigenous land management endure in IKS and are still reflected in current vegetation composition. So in this study, we conducted phytosociological plant community surveys in areas of historic and contemporary significance to indigenous peoples in service of demonstrating the cultural knowledge of people plant relations within the green belt and regenerating and restoring IKS. We specifically focused on areas along historic indigenous trails, which were complex uh, systems of footpaths and waterways that facilitated movement, connectivity, and livelihood, and were focal areas for indigenous management. So these trails are these colored lines up there. Um, along these trails, we located sites at historic villages and resource gathering areas. Additionally, areas of contemporary significance were identified by Indigenous advisors. So in total, we surveyed 69 plots across 23 sites. At each plot, we identified and recorded the cover of all plant species. Uh, we also took pictures and we collected 1,204 herbarium specimens of plants to provide a permanent record of their occurrence and to produce visual representations for the field guide and atlas. Alyssa General and Dr. Dolan accompanied the field team to some of the field sites to work with us on Indigenous ethnobotany. Uh, so now we'll hear from Marina Johnson on Indigenous data sovereignty. My name is Marina and I am Mohawk Wolfman from Upper Sesame. I am also a second year PhD student at Cornell University in Information Science. And so I'm very excited to be opening this theme because we are working towards applied, context specific uh, practices of Indigenous data sovereignty, also known as IDS. So, in the creation of the Digital Atlas and Field Guide, our team acknowledges and works actively against the sketchy histories, extractivist practices and the bad relations of which Indigenous communities are often on the receiving end of. Atlases and field guides have often been used as modes of conquest and knowledge acquisition and resource aggregation through naming and claiming. So natural history and uh, botanical studies was kind of treated as this leisure pursuit and justified settler colonial entitlements to dispossess Indigenous communities from their homelands. And so in that part, we ask, how do these settler colonial histories shape, inform, and limit our possibilities of research going forward? And our mode of traversing that relational space is by enacting and practicing methods of IDS and data reclamation. IDS refers to the rights of Indigenous communities to own, control, and manage their own data and the interpretation of it through the unique community developed protocols. So operationalizing IDS methods, such as the Nagoya protocols and the care principles, actually enhances machine and digital actionability and resolves both individual and Indigenous community interests along different data life cycles. And data reclamation is the process of turning to extracted knowledge within historical and institutional archives and placing it back within Indigenous, in our case, Odinishani and Anishinaabeg literature in order to allow for these plant data facets to exist as these living and breathing subject matters. We've been saying that this allows for the plant data to be storied rather than simply stored. And then the orature acts as the framework for our digital architectures. So in our construction of the digital atlas and field guide, our Odinishoni and Anishinaabe partners have full access and regulatory stewardship of their ethnobotanical data that lives in these frameworks. And I believe that this is very essential to promoting the self-determination and empowerment of Indigenous communities in the collection, management, and use of their own ethnobotanical data. So I'm very excited to see how these materials will continue to manifest with these anti-colonial Indigenous methodologies implemented into them. So I'll go ahead and pass the mic back to Nia. Uh, Nia will go off. So our field survey generated a list of 452 vascular plant species and cross-referencing with Dr. Dolan's indigenous botanical data sets, we identified 225 ethnobotanical species. So our results showed the ethnobotanical significance of the plant communities in the Greenbelt and the living knowledge of people-plants relationships there. 
Our data do not reflect all of the culturally significant plants present in the green belt, nor all of Odinoshoni and Anishinaabe ethnobotany. So where we're currently at is um, we're working to combine data sets and to refine the indigenous nomenclature of the ground truth to ethnobotanical species. Dr. Dolan is writing plant profiles that incorporate plant biology and cultural information, including nomenclature in Latin, English, Ghanian Geha, Anishinaabe Moen, and translations of the indigenous names into English. It contains species descriptions, conservation status, habitat preference, harvesting protocols, uses, and stories. We're also using our own botanical photography, scans of the herbarium specimens, historical photographs from the Wa archives, and also other photographic contributions to go with their plant knowledge. The field guide will also feature written introductions by the major participants of the team, including an introduction in Ghanian Geha and in Anishinaabe Moen. Deha Hande Miller, pictured here, uh, named the book, and Alyssa General is designing the cover, so this is her art. So in conclusion, we are shaping our research of plant and tree relatives through building our project around cultural knowledge and responsibilities embedded in Odinoshoni and Anishinaabe relationships with them. We're using Western science in service of regenerating and restoring IKS by investigating indigenous land management legacies within the plant communities of the Greenbelt and combining that with oral, historical, and ethnographic insights into indigenous living cultural legacies of relations with plants and trees. These choices serve our greater goal of uh, creating materials that will serve Native communities first um, and the general public second. So our deliverables are shaped to support Indigenous environmental departments to implement nation-to-nation -nation government relationships, um, education, co-governance, and treaty relationships uh, with settler governments and citizens. We hope our work will contribute to the, uh, sorry, we hope our work will demonstrate the enduring nature of Indigenous relations with the land in Southern Ontario and educate the public about Native people's timeless and living relations with plants and trees. So thank you all for listening. Um, our gratitude goes out to these people listed below. And if you have any questions that can't be answered in person, please free, uh, feel free to email us at these emails uh, above. Thank you.